So hello and welcome, happy Friday. Today is Friday, December the 30th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 190. My name is Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I'm glad that you're here for our very last Q&A of 2022. If you're new, you want to know what we're going to talk about, please look down in the video description below, and you're going to see all the topics in order and some possible references that give you additional information. And hopefully for the opening sequence, you saw my germinated hyssop plants that I'm growing here inside the house. Great way to break up your winter and get some things going that later can be transplanted and will be perennial on your property for your bees. So I hope everybody had a fantastic Christmas. I hope you have a great uh, plan for New Year's Eve. What I do for New Year's Eve is kind of what I do every other day. Just hang out right here. So how hot is it outside? Makes it hard to be inside right now, to be honest, because it's teetering between 59 degrees Fahrenheit and 60, and the sun is shining. 15 Celsius, that's what that is. And we don't have a lot of questions today, so we're going to jump right into it and get rolling. If you want to know how to submit your own question, please look down in the video description for the link that takes you to my website, thewaytobe.org, and there's a page there, also titled The Way to Be. There's a form. You can fill it out. First question comes from Jim from Burlington Falls, New York. I have a few questions all related to mite control. And for those of you who don't know what that is, Varroa destructor mites. They feed on your bees. Number one culprit for the demise of your bees and, of course, spreading disease. They've also found their way into Australia now, which was living free and clear of them for a while. But I think they have it pretty much under control, thank goodness. But we have to control them here. So, very first mite question is, do you have a good reference discussing the correlation between mite counts by screened bottom boards versus the sugar roll method? Everyone says a bottom board count isn't very good as a diagnostic, but there are many who rely upon it due to its ease. So we'll hit that one first. What we're talking about is uh, the varroa destructor mites. These are the females that leave the cells, and they're the, they're the ones, the foundress mites, that produce all the troubles in the hive when it comes to parasitic infection of your bees. Uh, what happens is if the mite dies of you know natural causes, old age, let's say, mite can live four months, whatever, and if she dies and she falls through that number eight screen or whatever you have, it goes right onto a bottom insert sheet or a tray or something like that. That's valuable for beekeepers. Now what that's good for is letting you know, number one, do I even have mites in that hive? Yep, when you pull that tray out, you can see how many mites and other detritus uh, there is down there and it'll show you a lot of what's going on in your hive. So I think it's great to have a screen bottom board that's completely enclosed. I'm not a fan personally of open screen bottom boards. So anyway, when you find the mites on the bottom board, that lets you know that you have mites, but over what period of time did they show up there? And so I always tell people, especially before you do a oxalic acid or any other mite control measure, clean the bottom board or clean the tray, whatever it happens to be. If you have a standard solid bottom board on your beehive, which is the basic Langstroth configuration, you can't do any of this. So this is related to people that have screen bottom boards with an insert or enclosed bottom boards like a lot of the flow hives have with trays in them. And this lets you collect things from the bottom of your hive. So if you have this ability, then you'll know that you have mites uh, on the bottom. But it's really important because what happens is, and the way I use it, when you have an oxalic acid vaporization treatment that you apply, within the next 48 hours, you see a huge mite drop. And when you see the mite drop, it gives you a chance to count them. Some of the bottom boards have adhesive already assigned to them, already applied to them. And then of course there's a grid on the bottom. Usually it's a one inch grid and it helps you do a count of your varroa mites. Now is there a correlation between that and doing a sugar shake or a alcohol wash or a Dawn Ultra free and clear wash? Uh, they're really very different but they do show levels. For example, 
Pre-treatment, you had weeks or several days of mite drops down there, and that's what inspired you to give a treatment maybe in the first place if you're not taking the hive apart. Pull out the boards, clean it off really well, put them all back. Then, of course, do your oxalic acid vaporization treatment or whatever your preferred treatment method is. And then you should see an initial heavy drop. And then you run the duration of whatever that mitocide is. So for the oxalic acid vaporization, you might be doing another treatment in five days. So you try to get a feel for how many mites are on that bottom board. And then when you do the next treatment, if you see the same number in the mite drop, then you're killing mites, but the mite numbers inside the hive are not reducing. So this isn't really about counting individual mites, but kind of seeing whether or not you're still killing a lot of them. And then when you do the third or the fourth treatment, that's when you find five or 10 instead of 50 or 60. So then you know that whatever you were doing to treat for mites was working. So it's really good for that. I don't think there is a direct correlation between a mite count, which is taking the physical bees from the hive, from the brood, and their nurse bees that are highly targeted by the varrodestructor mites when they're outside of their cells, and doing an actual concentrated count on those bees. That's much more effective. But if you're hitting the minimum threshold anyway, and you know that you have to treat, you really don't need to do a higher or more accurate count, in my opinion. So, so now I move on to the second part of this question. If you need to use OAV during a honey flow, what is the best way to isolate the supers? Place a cookie sheet just above the queen excluder for 15 minutes, or should I remove the honey supers for longer? How to protect the supers while they're off? Okay, so for those of you who don't know, your honey supers are above your brood boxes, and they should have nothing but honey in them. And in the past, before oxalic acid vaporization was approved with honey supers on, you had to take them off. The good news is that now uh, we're approved to do oxalic acid vaporization treatments with honey supers on. So check with your own state. Some of the states can be tighter in their restrictions. Maybe California is. I don't believe, now this is from New York, I think that New York State allows oxalic acid vaporization treatment with your honey supers on, so I don't think this applies. If you were to do it, um, and you really personally, for some reason, wanted to remove your honey supers so that the oxalic acid doesn't settle on them, uh, the FDA has proven that that's clear, that it's not enough to be an issue for human consumption, and of course it's not an issue for going back to bee feeding. But um, could you isolate it? You could, if that was just a personal thing. And then the point is, once it's done vaporizing, once it settles on all the surfaces, so within a couple of hours, you could put them back. And the cookie sheet method is actually something I used to do before we got approval for oxalic acid vaporization. So that was pry up one end of the super, tilt it forward, slide the cookie sheet under, settle it back down. Then, of course, you've got bees up there. The target would be the bees that are in the brood area. So you do get some bees that kind of escape treatment that way. I personally would leave it on. So regarding the accuracy, if you're doing sugar shakes or washes and things like that, those are technically more accurate because you have a controlled sample size, 300 bees on average. So if you were then, of course, relying just on the bottom boards, you're looking at the whole hive's exposure. So some colonies are huge, the numbers are way up, therefore you would have more mites, and it wouldn't be very accurate at regarding mite load per bee. So I hope that makes sense. And uh, in answer to the third part, necessary to vacate the bees in the honey supers, or is the OAV aimed at nurse bees around the brood? It is aimed at nurse bees around the brood. And the next question comes from Robert from Marshall, Missouri. I've been scraping dead bees from my hive, and I always heard not to knock on the side of your hives. It causes them to become more active. Wouldn't the noise of scraping cause the same reaction? Okay, this is something, you know, people in wintertime, beekeepers want to know, are my bees alive? Is everything okay in the hive? And some people like to rap on the side of it. And of course, bees respond to vibrations, and there's a little roar that comes up. But I think uh, if your hearing is okay, you can just put your head right up against the side of the hive and you'll hear them in there. There's a gentle hum anyway without you knocking on it at all. 
Is it going to cause a huge problem if you knock on it, hear the little roar, and then they settle back down? Probably not. But, uh, of course, now the comparison is, is that the same as scraping out your entrance? So this is a hive tool that we use for just scraping out dead bees. And this plastic end here, scraping ice and snow off the landing board, for example. But um, is it the same if you just stick this in there and drag out dead bees? Does that send a vibration through the hive that's going to wake up your bees and bother them? Uh, I think this is much less invasive because it really doesn't make much of a vibration. But while I'm talking about that, I have the Apame hives this year too, and I use quarter inch dowel rods because they have little holes, and I've been poking those, and they are covered in dead bees. So if you're not out there, some of the hives, you know, like one in 10 has a blocked entrance. <clears throat> Day like today, when the bees are all flying, it's very obvious. And if you don't get out there and clear those little entrances, and if they were actually waiting to get the entrance clear so they could fly, as soon as you clear the entrance, you're going to notice them flying out. That's going to let you know that you benefited that hive by clearing that entrance. But listen carefully first at the side of the hive and see if you don't already hear the noise of the bees. But your best non-invasive method for looking at your hive to see if they're alive or not is if they're clearing a little path in the snow already. You've got snow over the landing board when you go out there to clear the entrances or whatever you're doing. If there's already a little melted path in there, then you know they're venting and moving air that you have live bees. So knocking and listening might not be necessary. If you can afford it, get a thermal camera like a FLIR and you can look at that. And those are good for a lot of things, not just for your beehives. So if you had a FLIR thermal camera, you can you know see how well your house is insulated, for example, as well as looking at your beehives works really well on non-insulated hives and lets you know where your cluster is located. So those are really handy. Um, those that knock on the side of hives, if that's the only way you can hear them and it's really critical for you to know if your bees are alive or not, because that's the other thing, is that knowledge for the sake of knowledge, because if they're dead, what are you gonna do? This time of year, nothing. So it's really not that critical to know if my bees are alive or dead right now, it's a feel good thing to knock and listen. All right, you're good. Everybody's settled in there and they're still alive and stuff like that. So it's, it's basic information in spring. We want to know because that's when you're going to do overhauls, clean outs, and you're going to get rid of dead colonies and you're going to start making room for splits and things like that. But in the winter time, there's nothing you're going to do with a dead colony. So opening them up to check to see if they're alive is something I would never do. I would open the top and look at my fondant to see if the pack still has enough fondant resources in it. And considering the weather that we have right now, it's a great opportunity to do that. But there you have a purpose for getting in there. So I would suggest that during winter, you have no purpose in knocking on the hive and determining whether or not they're alive or dead when there's nothing that you would do as a follow-on activity if they were determined to be dead. So all it does is help you plan for spring. Question number three, Nancy from Harleysville, PA. My question, do bees police foragers for bringing in poor quality pollen or nectar? I heard you mention something about the bees communication practice of beeping or interrupting a waggle dance. Why do they do that? And this is really good. I think this might even be um, discussed in Dr. Thomas Seeley's Biology of the Honey Bee. Uh, the thing is, the scouts and foragers aren't always very good at picking resources because we've all heard the story about, you know, or observed honeybees foraging around and packing things onto their hind legs like it's pollen, but it really has no nutritional value to the bees at all. For example, the chalk lines on soccer fields and football fields sometimes get visited by honeybees thinking that that's some kind of pollen resource and they pack it onto their hind legs or corbicula and they fly back. Some will get into your dustbin in your carpenter shop where the fine dust is, and they'll be packing that stuff on their legs too. What is going on with these bees? Some people have reported that they get into their chicken coop feeders and where the corn is all ground really fine, or some people feed mash to their chickens so it's already dusty. And then the bees will be collecting that. And then people will look at that and think, wow, they really want ground up corn, but they don't. They need the protein, which is the pollen, which has to come from flowering plants. That's for the brood. 
If they bring in something else, then the storekeeper bees are the ones that meet them on the waggle dance floor. For example, it's an area that they waggle dance on frequently, and that's where other foraging bees get their information about what's good to get, what's good to eat, what's acceptable to the colony, and what the colony needs is really determined by those nurse bees and the storekeeper bees. And it's the storekeeper bees that zip up there and will pay attention to what they're doing, do a little taste test there, some trophallaxis goes on, and if they don't like what that forger brought in, they stop the waggle dance by beeping them. It doesn't always happen, but it's something that can happen. And when they do that, they're letting that forager know that what you're bringing, we don't want, we don't need. And then you can end up with a forager that's got a bunch of nectar, for example, that it can't unload. And then that bee ends up doing the tremble dance and trying to get other bees to unload it. So it trembles all over the hive trying to get its nectar off. And if none of the bees take it, they go off and park themselves in a corner and they're done foraging for the day. So that's all dictated by the nurse bees and the storage bees and what they need. Root comes first, carbohydrates last. So that's what that is, beeping. Number four, this comes from Illuminati 2. That's the YouTube channel name. I live in Northeast Ohio and my colonies look my colonies took a major hit during the extreme cold we had last week. Lots of dead bees. And my hive tops are majorly insulated. Also during the cold storm, I covered the whole hives with moving blankets. Now they are small colonies and uh, we still have some winter left to go. My question is, on the sporadic warm days we get, if I give the one-to-one -one sugar water to induce egg laying, is that a good or a bad idea since it's basically January 1st? Okay, so there's two things there. One is uh, the one-to-one -one sugar syrup. That does not um, induce egg laying or brood production for the bees. It's a pure sugar. It's a carbohydrate for your bees to get them going and uh, give them the energy they need to warm and do the activities that they need to do inside the hive. It can benefit them when it comes to wax production and things like that, but it won't kick off brood. So part of that is um, you can feed them sugar syrup if you want to this time of year, in my opinion, away from the hive. So if you've got, like we have right now, it's 60 degrees, I know the bees are out there scouting for resources. So if I really wanted to put something out, I would put it out at the feeding station or your robbing station, whatever you've set up for your bees to find resources. Uh, and let foragers find that and bring it back in. I wouldn't put any sugar syrup on the hive this time of year. So that's two parts. It won't kick off brood. It just gives them an extra carbohydrate, something to do. And one of the reasons that I like feeding the bees when we get these warm breaks is because it's usually the stronger colonies that send out their foragers. They've got the surplus bees to do it. Uh, if they can find something to bring back to the hive that takes pressure off of them hunting out other weaker colonies of bees this time of year. So again, I would not put sugar syrup in the hive. The other thing is this uh, blanket, this moving blanket. Um, we have rain coming, so when rain, you need to, of course, get those away from your hives. Uh, once it's soaked, it has no more you know, insulation benefit at all. So I personally would put that away before it gets wet because we have a lot of rain coming this way. And then in final here it says, also fun fact, I'm seeing numerous drones coming out for cleansing flights. Thought that was cool for winter time. They don't all get kicked out, I guess. Okay, so here's something I want you to consider when it comes to seeing a colony this time of year. So we're, as mentioned here, we're almost on January 1st. And this location is northeast Ohio, so not far from where I am. If you're seeing drones in a hive, look at the size and overall health of those drones. Drones are male bees. For those who don't know it, they're large. And uh, oftentimes they indicate a prolific colony, a colony that's really maxed out, doing well, lots of resources. They can afford drones, so they produce drones. Somewhere around 20% of the colony can be drones during high brood production periods or when the nectar flow is on strong and they have the surplus to feed them. Now, the reason I bring it up is 
maybe you've noticed smaller drones. Drones, that they're definitely male bees. Their eyes come together at the top. They're very distinctive, but they could appear a little undersized. And this is just food for thought. Look at the drones that you're seeing on that colony and maybe you've gone queenless. It's just another angle because I'm trying to think of why they would be producing drones this time of year. They're not in a rapid buildup mode. Uh, very few of the colonies would be sitting fat and be thinking about producing drones because they're a huge energy drain on your colony to develop. So I would wonder if they're not smaller drones and why would the drones be smaller? Because when they've lost their queen, if you get workers that become layers and then they're laying workers, which is a term we hear a lot, uh, those drones are likely to be coming out of worker cells. What some people, some people call bullet cells because you'll see that the, the capping on those in the pupa state will really be convex. And then what comes out are undersized drones, not very good performing drones either. So look at them again and see if they might be really small. And you might actually have lost a queen. It's just something to consider. I'm not saying that's what happened. <clears throat> but if I saw drones coming out of a colony this time of year, I would definitely be paying attention to how healthy they look, how big they are. So question number five comes from Christy from Troy, Missouri. I hear people talk about the fact that the queen will restart laying after the winter solstice. Does that really have anything to do with her winter laying routine? How does she, bossing workers, know when to start rearing brood for the spring season? Okay, so this is not a simple, straight answer. It should, should be, because we want to plan and we want to know what our bees are doing when they're building brood and everything else. And those that have temperature sensors in their hives and things like that, we can tell when the brood is building because the temperature rises. And so we'll start to see temps in the low 90s on the outside of the mantle. The mantle is the cluster of bees around where the brood is being developed. So I don't think it has to do with solstice. I think it has to do with <clears throat> even the line of bees that you're keeping. For example, if you had Italian bees, the Italian bees brood up heavy and they almost don't go broodless all through the winter time. I've had them in the past and they ate me out of house and home when it came time for winter. They were the ones that we needed 70 pounds of honey on, you know, to get them through a winter. Where the bees I have now are kind of hybrids. So they're pretty well adapted to the area where I live. So they have an inherent rhythm that matches what's going on outside. And there are a lot of triggers. So it's not just solstice. It's not just the length of day and night and temperatures even sometimes. What it is is uh, the stimulus that comes from resources that they're bringing into the hive. So it's what's available outside. And uh, we have nurse bees and we have the winter fat-bodied nurse bees, fat-bodied winter worker bees. And uh, they carry a lot of resources in their body. So they're also responsible for stimulating and, uh, of course, producing brood in a time when stuff isn't coming through uh, the entrance of the hive yet. So for example, if we took another line of bees, uh, bee stock like carniolans, they take a long winter break. So in other words, those queens respond to what's coming through the entrance of your hive. So when pollen starts to slack off, that's probably the, the biggest key uh, because it's rare to have pollen without nectar. It's common that they'll have nectar without pollen. So then when the pollen backs off, the nurse bees are the ones that kind of direct the queen and, and hold her off from producing eggs or uh, brooding up. So with the carniolans, they may quit for a couple of months at a time. And so then, of course, they have, to, they have more to compensate for when spring comes. But for me, a backyard beekeeper, a line of bees that does that is much more suited to my environment because I don't like to feed the bees through winter. I don't want them to have a huge uh, brood pattern getting into spring when, for example, some of the very first resources that come are from trees, and they come from uh, Salix discolor here, which are the pussy willow trees. And uh, there are lots of trees that produce pollen early in spring, and that's what kicks off the beginnings of smaller brood. And then the big nectar load kicks in with more pollen, and so kind of seasonally here, when we see fields of dandelions blooming, that's when we know the colonies are really going to be ramping up. 
So it's a combination of things. It's the temperature outside. It's the resources that are coming in. And it's, of course, the health of your queen. It has to be healthy and good to go. But uh, I don't think to say solstice specifically, because this is variable depending on the bee genetics, depending upon what's going on weather-wise in the environment, and depending upon what's being produced in the environment when it comes to flowers, which are the key to the protein that we're going to need to develop brood. And then how quickly your bees forage. Now, when I go out in my yard uh, in the apiary, after I finish this video, I will see some colonies of bees that are just going gangbusters or flying everywhere. Others will be much more conservative and only sending out a few scouts. And that does not accurately indicate the number of bees inside the hive. Some bees, like carniolans, fly out earlier when it's colder. Even my weaver stock flies early and colder than some of the others do. So even colony by colony, you're going to see differences. So to say hard and fast by the, you know, the calendar solstice kicks it off, you can have a withdrawal from brood production in the middle of summer if you have a dearth and it's been really dry and it hasn't been raining and the resources aren't coming in. So it's a combination of stimulation that uh, has to inspire your bees to develop more brood or back off. So in the bees that do that the best in the environment that you're in uh, will become the easiest bees for you to manage because they're not going to starve themselves out because they don't have a bunch of brood when they don't have resources coming in. And those that do reduce brood require less food and resources going through winter, so they're better equipped to manage themselves going into spring and fall and every other part of the year. So that's why getting bees that match your environment play a key role in uh, how easy they are to manage. And they're, again, backyard beekeepers. We're not pushing for big resources. So these bigger broods, the Italians, you know, with the bigger brood, even though they cost more to get them through winter as far as sucrose goes, uh, when it comes to spring, they would also be able to be used in a commercial application better than, say, the carniolans would. But carniolans would be fantastic for uh, low-maintenance bees where you live. So I hope that helps. Question number six. Last question of the day. I've had to do lots of cutouts now because I have a little bit of a cough, so super annoying. Bryce writes... 19 degrees Fahrenheit this morning in central New Hampshire, 11 degrees Fahrenheit above average. Last year it was 27 Fahrenheit. I live in the forest and I have seen searching, I have been searching out the black locust and basswood that grows here and thinning the other trees around them as to encourage them. I know it takes a few years for basswood to flower. My question is this, at what age or size will basswood bloom? Thanks for your time. <clears throat> so here's the thing. Uh, basswood, I have linden trees, little leaf linden, and a couple of linden tree varieties. So mine, I bought them. They were already six years old. So by the time they were eight years old, they were producing pretty decent uh, flowers on them. And it's deceiving, too, because the flowers aren't prominent. So you'll start to see your bees paying attention to them. And, of course, the more they grow, the more flowers are on them, the more they get the attention of your bees, and the more they become a pollinator tree or a bee tree. And that's a segue to my shout out today. So my shout out today is going to be related to this question uh, because it won't be the same all over the country or even all over the world. So my shout out today is for a man named Mike Connor, C-O-N-N-O-R. And the video is called Mike Connor, colon, Bees and Trees. Now, Mike is the reason that um, I watched this video and, and learned about the potential for basswood, for linden trees, um, to produce massive amounts of nectar and a really good honey crop for your bees. So those that are living on smaller plots and things like that where they can't grow, you know, three or four acres of some floral source for your bees, you can have a quarter acre or a half acre and grow some large trees that it, you know, it's a game of patience because there'll be many years growing and developing but think of trees as vertical gardens. So really, I want you to watch Mike's uh, thing. So refill your coffee cups, whatever you're doing. It's a 55-minute presentation, and it's very, very helpful for beekeepers. 
So I hope that you'll look down in the video description and follow that link. So that's pretty much it for today. And I'm uh, sorry if I'm cutting it short. I'm trying to keep from having a cough right now. And uh, the rest of you, I will see you. That's the way to be. And I'll see you in 2023. So those of you who are going to Hive Life, we're going to see you there. And uh, I'm going to hide myself away and stay healthy until that happens. So thanks for watching and spending your time with me here today. Please look down in the video description for the links for more information. And uh, I hope that you're going into the new year in really good shape for beekeeping. Thanks for watching as always.